We're really lucky for the opening keynote to have the director of the Media Lab, Joey Ito, who's one of the most interest-driven collaborative learners that I've ever met. Before coming to the Media Lab, Joey has served as an entrepreneur and an early stage investor. Uh, he was the chairman and CEO of Creative Commons. Uh, he's the co-author of Whiplash, and he continues to serve on the boards of the New York Times, uh, the MacArthur Foundation, and the Knight Foundation. Joey will be, Joey will be in conversation with Baritunde uh, uh, Thurston, who describes himself as a futurist comedian, writer, and activist. He's the author of the best-selling book, How to Be Black. He served as director of digital for The Onion. He founded the blog jackandjillpolitics.com. He produced The Daily Show, and he advised the Obama White House, in addition to serving as a director's fellow, one of Joey's director's fellows here at the Media Lab. In his bio, he says that he's told jokes professionally on five continents. So I'd like to welcome to the stage Joey and Baratunde. What's up? <laughs> um, I, can I just say something right off the yeah, bat? Yeah. Uh, I, when you say I produce The Daily Show, it makes it sound like I was alone. Uh, <laughs> I was definitely one of many producers. That's a very generic title there. Um, and then to Eric, your intro was great. And I just, I appreciate what you did with the weaving of the Asgard. I just watched uh, Avengers Infinity Wars, and I'm still recovering. <laughs> so if I get a little misty-eyed, <laughs> It's not because of the death of the Republic, it's because I just watched a real sad movie. <laughs> All right, thank you for that, thank you. Um, so, we've known each other for a while. I guess I, guess I got to know you when I, I, mainly through the Director's Fellows Program. When you brought me to Detroit. When, I, when, I brought, when we hung out in Detroit yeah. with our friend Shaka. And, uh, um, but can I just start off by just saying something about Bertunde that was kind of, uh, 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 surprising to me, but also helped me think a lot about learning, to just kind of kick it off with a question. But like, um, when you were introducing yourself to the director's fellows, uh, you introduced yourself by saying that you, you weren't funny before. And when you were growing up, you, you weren't actually that funny, and that you were a, a kind of serious activist at Harvard. And you learned to become funny in order to deliver the message. Um, but so two questions. I, I want to kind of get you to tell that story a little bit. But also, I mean, just the you know, and, and, we, you know, and we can obviously have a conversation about this, but to me what was really interesting was the way that you described comedy as a way to, uh, well, the, my interpretation was a way to convey difficult uh, information uh, in a way that people uh, could more easily understand it or would more in, uh, engage and learn from it. And so can you just talk about that a little bit? Yeah, um, and I love being introduced as a comedian, but then reminding everyone that I wasn't funny. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> it's like already conflict, is drama, that's a good story, right? There's a key element of storytelling, is drama. So yeah, I was a very serious kid. My mother was a very serious woman. Uh, she raised me and my sister. She was the real activist. And she, through osmosis and pressure, like the instant pot of our house, uh, tried to and encouraged both of us to be more active in our community. So an early example was you know, she was out in the streets a lot as an activist herself. She occupied radio stations. She was of a generation of black people who were just starting to love themselves as black people. And that was very revolutionary. Act. She was a woman raising children alone. She was a computer programmer. Before that was like a common thing. So she had a lot of barriers that she was pushing through and a lot of pioneering that she was taking part in. And uh, with that type of mother, I didn't have typical like children's books. And one of the first books I remember having is called uh, This is Apartheid. <laughs> right? A pictorial introduction. So it was like a, my mom gave me an oppression picture book at eight years old, which is better than the pop-up version, right? So, <laughs> but that's, that's the stew that I was kind of um, marinating in from an early age. And it was high school that started to turn it. And I showed up at this private, primarily white high school, Sidwell Friends School, in seventh grade. And that was a hugely different environment. I grew up in DC, was a product of public schools, black and Latino neighbors everywhere in the Columbia Heights neighborhood before the metro and the bistros uh, and the people from Iowa showed up. 
And so Sidwell was the big adjustment. And I was really angry there because I think of the contrast of environment and the expectations and the judgments and just the cultural ignorance that I had about these other people. So years of that, years of dealing with typical minority student in majority wealthy environment dynamics made me fired up and ready to go constantly. So I like ran for president of the Black Student Union and I led protests and I wrote reports and I threw my fist in the air a lot. And it was toward the tail end of that that I started finding humor as a release of the pressure building inside of me. It actually had nothing to do with communicating with other people. It had everything to do with preserving my sanity and having room for my soul to breathe and not be like this all the time, which I felt like I was constantly on guard for being over-disciplined, for lowered expectations, for college expectations, for financial pressure. It's like it was a job on top of the job. So the humor began selfishly mm -hmm. as uh, a mode of, of self-healing, self-care, if you will. And then once I got to college, I started to express it in my own voice, and I started literally processing the news through humor and writing a newsletter that recontextualized what was happening in the world for my peers in a way that was funnier than was coming out of the institution whose board you're on, the New York Times. Look at you, so fancy. <laughs> I didn't even know he yeah, was no, on the board. You. How did you get so fancy, Joe? <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, oh, I'm not, dodging I'm not, the question. I'm not, I'm not taking that bait. Um, 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 I do not accept the premise of that question. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but, 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 like, I thought you told me that you had to learn to be funny, and now yeah. you're making it sound like it emerged. Well, learning and emerging are similar things. <laughs> um, because, so look, like, if you ask, honestly, I think if you ask my high school friends if I was funny, they would say yes because I seem funny now, and they want to be like, I was there. <laughs> right, like I was a witness, I saw it coming. No, you didn't. <laughs> like look at my yearbook. I'm doing like black power fists, I'm wearing, I'm dressed formally, like I'm not a lighthearted kid. And, and the practice came through writing. The practice came through, um, the newsletter that I started my freshman year of college forced me to try to channel this energy, this rage, this um, judgment, <laughs> very judgmental, very self-righteous, because mostly I'm, I'm right, right? So <laughs> you got to process that, because that doesn't come across well. <laughs> and, uh, and so, yeah, it took years. And then once I started performing comedy, uh, the audience will let you know that this isn't working. In fact, one show I did in this city, I started in Boston. And it was, I was doing a show for three people, because uh, I was very successful. <laughs> And it was three black women in the crowd, and I had been used to doing like the Cambridge coffee house kind of vibe. And they literally said, you're not funny. <laughs> like I wasn't done, you know? Like I was, I was still attempting to be funny on stage, right? And they're like, stop. They said, stop, 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 stop. We don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> this isn't working, this isn't funny. So we did an iterative design process. Uh, <laughs> Real-time feedback, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Customer-centric, you know? <laughs> a more collaboratively designed comedy set, and it got better. Uh, so I was forced to learn, and some of the talent that may have already been there did emerge. So I don't see that as a binary, mm -hmm. but the education was real, and the failures were and continue to be many. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and so, uh, obviously, the, the times in your age changed, but... Um, I'm still 12. Uh, you're still 12. <laughs> but like, because one of the, 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 the things I think a lot of the people here do the research on is what states cause learning to work better? And the idea that play or that humor um, help in education is, or learning, yeah. let's not use the word education, um, is, uh, is, is a positive thing. And, and I think at the Media Lab, we talk a lot about user interface. And I always think of comedy as a user interface for difficult things, and and and, and I think there's even a a, 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 a theory that um, the the idea of enjoying being surprised is sort of an un unnatural response if you think about just survival, but it's actually a response to try to reinforce people uh, who are learning through being surprised. And I think humor is kind of a, a way to surprise people into learning. Yeah. And and so I'm curious as you sort of went from the angry, um, you know. Uh, uh, activist to the 
the funny activist, because you're still an activist, right? And I'm still angry. And you're still angry. So you're angry, funny activist. <laughs> ha has the funny part, do you, do you, do you, can you sense or tell if it's more effective in getting a message across and, and, and how, like, can you, can you describe that as a, as a practitioner? That's a, that's a hard one. That was good. Um, sometimes. So the way that I try to deploy humor is it's a softener, right? It's a bridge builder, it's a relationship builder. And one of the things I learned, this, this is helping, um, just thinking out loud in front of a bunch of people. <laughs> <laughs> one of the things I learned was there's like a order of operation to connecting with someone uh, and communicating effectively with them. And it doesn't start generally to be effective with your point, right? It doesn't start with some uh, units of data or information <laughs> that is shipped from you to the recipient. It starts with a more human, emotional, energetic connection. And what stand-up, that version of comedy taught me, because I used to get on stage and just start like hammering away at the point. Like, Why don't you see the world the way I do? And they're like, we don't even know who you are. And that's actually what those women in the audience, the core of their point was like, who the hell are you? <laughs> Why are you talking to me about what's in the New York Times? I don't even know why I should care what you have to say. Tell me about you. And so I became more personal in my comedy. And I told more stories. And I talked about my mother. And I talked about the loss of my mother. And I talked about my divorce. And I talked about health. And I talked about joy before I got to the informational data units <laughs> of political incisiveness that I was sure would shape the world. You can't shape the world if nobody is engaging with you. Um, and, and so that humor is very effective at opening a channel of potential connection. And when you can find the common ground, like laughter is evidence of common ground. And it's a leading indicator of communicative, like effective communication. I say something, you agree by laughing, because it means you saw it the way I did. Mm -hmm. Or you saw yourself in it, which is the best version. So now I'm not talking about me, I'm talking about we. And it's that Muhammad Ali moment, like me, we, right? So, and I'm not saying I'm Muhammad Ali, though I did look like him when I was a kid. Chubby cheeks, chubby cheeks. <laughs> which strangers at my mom's office always, oh, I hated that. Now I'm traumatized. <laughs> The main point being that to use humor effectively in my activism required me to not see it as activism mm -hmm. all the time and to see it as bridge building. Um, and jokes are a good way to test out if you're able to connect with someone. So, so do you, sorry, it's just like, the, the, but the end when you're delivering the, the let's say the message or the yeah. data, are you still f funny there? Or yeah. do you pa have to package, I mean, like, or do you, do you so kind of like now that we're, Funny and we're friends, let me tell you this seriously. So, <laughs> it, it, it depends. So um, one example, uh, Scott Pruitt, he is the former administrator of the EPA, thankfully, and one person cares about democracy, that's cool. <laughs> the rest of you don't want to lose your 501c3 status. I get that. <laughs> I will laugh for you. Bravo, Barrison. Well played. But I love this guy because He's like, he engaged in so much criminal behavior, right? Like just flagrantly criminal shit. And he did it in part to help his wife get a job. Bro, like he tried to use his official government position to get his wife a job as a Republican lobbyist, to get his wife a job at Chick-fil-A, which makes her like the least employable white woman in America, right? <laughs> like what is wrong with, you know? And then, but it's also like, how much do you love this woman? that you're willing to do so many crimes for her. Like, that's real love, you know? And we can all identify with that. So, yes, I'm going in on Scott Pruitt, but I'm also celebrating love. And that's a bridge building moment. Right? Exhibit A. Exhibit A. <laughs> um, so, did you say that your mother was a programmer? Yes, yes. And Cobol, could... baby. Wow. Where are my cold ball heads at? There's one left. <laughs> Protect her at all costs. She runs the payroll system of half the federal government. Uh, 
but but did you did you do technology? Because you you always integrate technology. Yeah. And stuff. I mean, so, how did that? So um, yes and no. <laughs> I was always uh, curious about and playful with technology. I took things apart as a, as a kid. I never put them back together. <laughs> so I got the first part down. Right? Deconstruction, dissection, that was my thing. Um, but we had a computer in our house from age six, and that affected the course of my whole life. And I knew how to use computers. So I would make, you know, in the early days of like desktop publishing and layout, I would make flyers for all my mom's friends. I would write letters because I knew how to use you know, uh, Word and WordPerfect before Word. And so it gave me a, a financial advantage. It gave me like a relevance advantage. I started mucking around on the internet in 93 when my school got a full-time connection. And it was like one Unix box in the corner with a T1 from UUNet. Yeah, oh, you can tell the OGs, I love it. And I started coding in C, just raw in, in Unix at the time. And then when I got off to college, I mixed around in Perl and uh, CGI and like scripting things. So again, mid 90s, late 90s. Uh, and HTML, which isn't exactly coding, but it's sort of like creative, or it's very creative. But I, and I started majoring in computer science. I went to Harvard up the block, and uh, I did not persist in computer science. I chose philosophy instead. I wanted something far less monetizable, and I succeeded. Uh, life was too easy, you know? <laughs> Black in America, nailed it. What else you got? <laughs> I have an unsellable, highly leveraged degree. Uh, so uh, my relationship with computers and computer science has been informal and much more integrated and applicable. Uh, the jobs I've had have all had a level of technology at the core. I worked in a consulting agency in this town for years that was around designing business models for an internet age and new media and streaming. The Onion job was director of digital. The Daily Show job was supervising producer for digital expansion. Um, and the company I started after I left The Onion, which we did some work here, Cultivated Wit, we merged humor and technology. So it's been more integrated, it's been heavily playful, and it's been like applied mm -hmm. technology. But I don't just bust open you know, and start writing code these days. But so at Cultivated Wit, you did apps, right? Because I, I remember, I, it's funny, because the, the, the title just makes me remember it was, was I think it was Location-Based Racism. Was oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> but like, like, was that your, how, who's like, was that a, a hackathon idea or? Because I, I think that, again, the way that you integrated humor yeah. into technology in a way to get people to first start paying attention, but then actually absorbing what's actually going on yeah. was kind of interesting. I don't know if you want to talk about that app or sure. something else. But so so the, the general concept of one of the many activities we did as a confused company um, was a comedy hackathon. We call it Comedy Hack Day. You can still see the projects at the comedyhackday.org, but we haven't done them in, the, in two years now. And so we brought developers, designers, and comedians together for two days of play intentionally mixing these teams up to create a functional uh, app or hardware, actually there was some hardware built, that was funny. And so we, you know, there have been like 1,200 of these projects over the years from us running the events and sort of a TEDx type model where we open sourced it and people can still do them. So the best winningest idea that probably came out of that was Equitable, which you can still get in the app store. It's a bill splitting app, so if you, Go out to lunch with friends, you need to split the bill. This app will split that bill fairly, mm -hmm. not equally. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the woke ones already get it. <laughs> I see you, sis. <laughs> so um, it will take into account the race and gender of the participant, <laughs> and then it will use real pay data uh, from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, <laughs> and it will close the pay gap, <laughs> one meal at a time. Right. So that was, and a woman named Luna Malbrew pitched that idea and organized the team at one of our events, I believe in San Francisco, and you can download that right now. It still works. In fact, it got a lot of pushback from uh, Nazis. Uh, <laughs> turns out Nazis don't like paying more. <laughs> 
So, and then the location-based racism was uh, an idea of mine. I talked a lot about it, to be real, like we never quite built it. But the notion, this was during the heyday of Foursquare. Remember Foursquare? Oh. I still use Swarm, which is a You're the last one. Yeah. Uh, I know a few others here. I mean, it makes sense. You're at MIT. You're like obligated to uh, use technology that you don't have to use. <laughs> you can just go places, actually. You don't have to tell everybody and calculate the popularity matrix. Um, but it was like, okay, this app is helping me discover like good coffee. Um, what if I could discover bad racism and like avoid it? And what if, you know, what if we could do a heat map of indicators of racism? from anecdotal to pay gap stuff to policing incidents. And you know, Waze is very good at routing, uh, but can it route me around racism? <laughs> because that's a very inefficient path for me to walk in this world. <laughs> so they're optimizing for speed traps. I want racist traps, right? Um, and so the, the concept, and one team did build something like that around cops, specifically cops, and where incidents were happening or where uh, so they could route you around police presence if you were a person of color. Mm -hmm. Yeah. See, so, now it's not funny. So, now it's so, like, oh. <laughs> but that's so true. <laughs> but, but I, I was talking to Alex McGillery, who uh, was a lawyer engineer, and he said he was the first product counsel at Google where they used to just bring products to the lawyer's desk, but he was embedded in a product team. Now I think there are hundreds or thousands of product counsels as a job. And it sounds like, you know, this, this uh, this comedian on the team, like, do you, do you guys have a comedian yet? I mean, it seems like like having comedy as part of a design process yeah. sounds like a good idea. I mean, have I you thought about scaling love, comedy to yeah. indus industrial? I have not, but you just gave me a great idea. <laughs> and given that these technology platforms have devalued content so much, I think it's only fair that they build a jobs program for comedians. Uh, to have some sustainable income in the future. <laughs> You're thinking about it in a very structured way. But, 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 no, but, but seriously, I, I, I think that if you could describe kind of what you did with the yeah. Comedy Hackathon and show some of the examples, and then you can get some, some researcher here to actually measure the engagement and, uh, and the learning outcomes. <laughs> I, I, I bet you could show the value of having that. Now, and so, so this ties back to, I'm still going to keep poking you on how okay. you learn about comedy. How do you teach it? How do you learn it? Like, because because you went through this path that sounds like an iterative process of yeah. of embarrassing yourself and learning, um, but but there's schools and stuff, right? Did you go to school? Did you? How did you? Was there any formal learning in your comedy, or was it uh, was it is it nature or nurture or what, 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 what was it? Hey, hey, definitely wasn't nurture. Uh, pain. It was pain. the opposite of nurture, uh, <laughs> torture. <laughs> so yes, when I began. Um, there was, it was all informal. I just started writing the newsletter. And so my first, there's so many different ways to do comedy. You can be on an improv team. You can do sketch. You can write um, scripts. You can write monologues. You can do parody magazine graphics covers. You can do stand-up comedy. So I began with a satirical email newsletter, which involved just me. And so you didn't have a mentor? No, in the beginning, no. The world was my mentor. It was really so you just a... watched funny things or read funny things? I, so I grew up, here's, here's the more complete and fair answer. I grew up <laughs> listening to and absorbing a lot of comedy. My mother was a big fan of British humor. Uh, the closest we had to cable television was PBS. So, right? <laughs> One poor person in the room <laughs> from childhood. <laughs> Uh, actually, you know, poor people have a lot of cable. Um, so yeah, we would watch, you know, One Foot in the Grave and Are You Being Served and uh, Chef. Chef was like a showcase in linguistic assassination, right? He's so good with words and so sharp. So I watched that at a really young age. We would listen to audio cassettes on our road trips because those were the affordable trips. You get in the station wagon and you stop at campgrounds <laughs> and you call it a tour. Um, and so we listened to uh, Whoopi Goldberg and Garrison Keillor and Bill Cosby, may he rest in peace, and, uh, or pain, actually, may he rest in torture. Um, and we would, so I had this passively going on. This is before I ever thought that I might create humor myself. So I'm, I'm sure that was a background education, timing and tone and voice. And then once I started down the path for real, I did take a class at the Boston Center for Adult Education. And every Monday night, a man named Steve Kalishman, who was a local stand-up, 
He wrote for Men's Health Magazine. He's at the comedy studio up in Cambridge, uh, in Harvard Square, where I started. He taught a class. And so he would give us exercises. And we just, the best way to learn is to do. Like, it's not a, I guess if you wanted to ruin comedy, you could just study it <laughs> and come up with theories and try to, you know, destroy it by breaking it down into its component parts. But doing it is the more effective way to learn. So ultimately, that class was about performing and getting up in front of these 10 other people and telling probably bad jokes. Uh, yeah. So, so for those of you watching the stream, we didn't pay him to just explain how you learn through doing it. So it's, it's, <laughs> it just turns it out emergent. it works. It works. <laughs> and you know, the other, um, it's not exactly on the same line, but you're, I'm remembering something my mother said when I was really young. She never expected teachers to teach. When she sent me off to school, she would say, you have to like grab that knowledge. They're not going to give it to you. Don't wait for them. Go get it. And she said it at enough, a number of different stages in my life so that I've never really repeated that out loud before, but I think it's this drumbeat associated with my heart as I move through the world. And there's something about taking, engaging, pulling, and not just waiting for someone to push. That's also an important part of how I think I implicitly approach learning, which is like, get it. Because the world is not always interested in giving. Yeah. Oh, shit. <laughs> now you're getting into your preacher mode, I can tell. Uh, <laughs> that's what channeling moms does. <laughs> how did, what's your educational like learning journey? Because I feel like you have this non-traditional thing. New PhD, by the way, give it up. <laughs> Dr. Joy Ito. But here's why I'm curious, because you didn't grow up in this country. You're running a major institution. You're a part of these other ones. And so much of learning is cultural. But you have you know, a less formal education from the early years, and you've had to pull together some set of knowledge to be able to interface with all these different universes that weren't the ones you were born into. So what's some of your path to be able to do that? So, so, so I. First of all, my, my mom never said that to me, and that's probably why I didn't end up graduating. But, um, um, but my sister graduated, and she got straight A's and has got two PhDs properly. And so, Do you um, know that because your, your mom always reminded you of that? <laughs> no, no, <laughs> you no, know your no, sister no, has. No, no, but, she, but she did. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> but, um, so, so it wasn't really a lack of opportunity, and I'm sure my mother would have encouraged me to do it. But so I, I think I had an... Uh, I wouldn't call it a disability, but at least a form of disability vis-a-vis. -vis. I mean, I got kicked out of kindergarten for running away too much. So, Yo. so it was an early thing. That's an achievement. Um, so, so, but, you know, but we were surrounded by academics, and we, we had a lot of scholarship around us. And so I was always curious, but I didn't like <laughs> to learn anything unless it fit into the model of the world that I was building or the thing I was working on. And so. Like if somebody said, you should learn this because it might be useful someday, that never, I just couldn't do it. Right. Like, and, and knowledge for the sake of knowledge was never a thing for okay. me. I think my sister labels me interest-driven learner as sort of a category. And so... Um, uh, How does it feel to be labeled by your sister? <laughs> <laughs> um, it, yeah, you know, it was helpful. I was like, oh, there's a word for this. Yeah. So, um, although, I, the PhD, I, I sent it off to one of my sister's mentors who's a... Uh, a very famous uh, 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 scholar in learning. And I take my life story, so you can read my dissertation. It's a life story and then kind of what I learned from it and I generalize all these things. And he said, well, you know, it's great, but, and you had a fascinating life, but you shouldn't generalize about things because you're a subspecies. There maybe isn't anyone else like you. And um, maybe, actually, I might know one other person. And so, so, so one of the things I think is important is there's sort of a survivorship bias mm. issue which is just because I survived with this peculiar disability of getting through and learning in a certain way, in a structured way, doesn't mean it's the best path. And so I'm always careful about trying to generalize my own experience, which is really just being impatient and just trying to do things and learning things as I do them. Now, it's easier now that we have the internet. So I think before, people like me just got cut off, right? And you were like, that was it. 
And I got lucky because just around high school, the internet was developing, and so I could just get online and play video games and meet people and chat professors, and, and I would just learn through hanging out with people. Um, and then I could then I would go visit them and stuff like that. Uh, but that sounds terrifying. <laughs> Potentially, right? You're like I was a teenager and I would hang out online and meet people and go visit them. Yeah. <laughs> Did anyone else not hear the possible violations well, of various codes? No, but, 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 but like the thing, I, I do think though that that um, the fear that we have about connecting adults to children is really also hurting yeah. kids' abilities to find mentors. And so when I was when I was like 15, I would find adults. I remember when I was 15. Um, I, uh, I'm pretty sure I was 15. Um, I went to a wedding of two people who had met on the source. This is a pre-internet. And um, Carl Gottlieb, who used to write jokes for Smothers Brothers, was one of the guests. This is yeah. my first international travel by myself. And he picked me up at the airport and we drove to the wedding and he just told me jokes the whole way. Yeah. And it was great. And we, and we got there and it was a whole bunch of people that were like, I was I think probably the youngest. All people who had never met before, the best man had never met before, and this is like in 80, like in the mid, like early 80s, right? And, um, but like people treated you as a 15 year old as if you were an adult, if you could sort of interact as if you were an adult. And, and so that was really helpful for me. And, um, and, and, and I was, anyway, so the, 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 the media lab is also a peculiar place because I always tell my students that, you know, if I were here, I would have graduated. You know, um, and the reason, by the way, that I got the PhD wasn't so much that I felt like I needed to get the PhD, but now at the Media Lab, a lot of what we do here is generate PhDs. Mm -hmm. And so I felt it, that it was unfair to the students that I'd never actually you know, use the product that we were right. creating. And so, so for me, it was... Um, Not just the president, but a customer. <laughs> yeah. <and> so, <laughs> <laughs> um, but but I, I, I do feel like go, having going through slowly learning about the formal education process gives me the ability to now have some uh, enough in understanding to be able to talk about how to change it. So, so that's partially why I'm, I'm doing this stuff. But, but anyway, I, th I think it, I'm a, I would, I'd be a traditional interested in learner in that I just, I just learned what I wanted to do. And I find when I used to teach scuba diving, which is the only thing I was certified in before I got my PhD. Um, <laughs> uh, it's so it's weird. A, it's I a, love it. But the, the, the teachers would drop off. I used to teach junior high scuba diving in, when I was in Dubai. And the teachers would drop off a class of kids. And they would always say, these two kids, watch out for them. They're the troublemakers. They would always be the best scuba diving students. They were always the ones where I would say, you have to learn Boyle's Law, because when we're in the ocean, you got to do this. And I would always, and, and the key to scuba diving is you teach really difficult math and science but always you're, you're supposed to tie it into an activity that's gonna happen within the next 30 minutes or an hour so right. that everybody has this incentive. Now the other kids, the good students, like is this gonna be on the test? Why am I here? You know, and, and so they kind of didn't want to focus on learning anything that didn't have a long-term impact. Right. And so, so it was also I think this, this, th this weird thing about that they didn't want to learn this stuff. So, so I think it's just different categories of things and, and one controversial thing, just reminded me was um, a friend of mine in Silicon Valley was saying, and I don't know if this is true, but this is just, I thought it was funny. Um, was he was saying that uh, the recent educational system was a period of um, uh, uh, where the pendulum had swung towards OCD. Mm -hmm. And there were a bunch of OCD people trying to make, uh, not OCD, yeah, OCD people trying to make uh, short attention span people comply with their order. And that, uh, that we were the sort of neurodiversity disadvantage quartile. And that now with technology and other things, it's going to swim back. Yeah. And that we will start to uh, uh, tip the scales um, uh, away from the, the OCD types. But I had never thought of the world as sort of OCD versus ADD. But it's a whole new way to discriminate. I love it. I love it. But, but, Forget but, racism, like <laughs> neurodiversity. Yeah, yeah. Oh. But, 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 but I think it is interesting because I do think there is a kind of a, a distribution yeah. of where you are on how structured you are. And, um, and I think I was kind of on the, on the far end of um, order. Thank but, you. But now we have institutions where there's hundreds of people like me. <laughs> <laughs> what are you? Oh, go ahead. Okay. I can, well, are we supposed to do Q&A in this? Okay, we, we, we. You, you do one more, I'll do one more, then we'll let them have a shot. <laughs> well, so I'm, I'm curious, um, do you do 
not funny things. If, like your 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 no no no, no. I, 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 like like <laughs> like as you start to think about what you need to do in this climate where um, we have lots of scary non funny things going on. Um, is, is, is it through humor that you're going to be delivering all of your activism and your energy, oh. or, or, or do you, and, and, then, and then do you have like a different name for the <laughs> version of you that's not funny? So, um, I, my name is big enough to contain multiple me's. <laughs> I got four syllables, right? That's like a pretty weighty name. Um, and I don't think everything should be channeled through humor. I think humor is in a set of tools that is useful to accomplish something. There are other tools. Uh, there are, is money is a tool. I have less of that <laughs> than I do of jokes. Um, you know, organizing is a tool. Passion is a tool. Empathy is a tool. Um, connectivity is a tool. Information flows are tools. And in this time, I think we need every tool possible. So the way I think about it, I mean, there's some really horrible horrible things going on, non-funny things going on. Sometimes you can make non-funny things funny. Sometimes that's not enough to have an impact on the world the way you want. And so you go to a rally, or you harass your representative on the phone again, or you fund some local institution that is helping people become citizens, despite the fact that the body politics seems to say, we don't need you here anymore, because you know that's stupid and you fund the smart thing. Like the library, right? Like the library. Yeah, I've recently joined the board of the Brooklyn Public Library. Fancy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, first of all, because librarians are just like the best people in the world. Right? They're just the best people. And they're radical, but they don't seem it, so they're like spies, you know? Because <laughs> you're just like, oh, that's so cool. You just like card catalog. No, you're like, shit up. You know, it's like, it's really powerful to provide level access to knowledge and information yeah. to anyone, regardless of their documentation status or their economic status, their religious status, their racial status. That is, is one of the last democratic bastions we have in this nation, I think, is the, is the public library. So I'm very honored to like, be a part of the, a main one. Like, Brooklyn is the largest system we have. Um, so that's, that's other ways to do it. I don't think jokes are enough. I think they can be a part of it. But we have, we're on this precipice. Like I sort of joked about the death of the Republic, but it's not a joke. We are witnessing and part of a pivotal moment of deconstruction. And we have an opportunity for reconstruction. So the optimist in me is like, okay, okay, everything burns down, fertile ground, what better crops can we grow? The pessimist in me is like, I don't, there's no, law that says we have to exist in this unit, in this form, with these norms. Like, it's not codified. It's just a passive agreement. Like money, right? It's not real. It's just a mass delusion. And so we've deluded ourselves into the thinking, we'll always be the United States of America. Well, maybe. Maybe not. So it's up to us. And, and that's not funny, right? That's real. And I don't mind playing in the real as well. I think there's power in the dance. Uh, what are you seeing? This, maybe we won't get to them. I'm so sorry, but I, I think <laughs> I just think my question is more important. <laughs> and it's just you know technically it's going to be hard to, to get all the logistics down. We can tweet later. You you have this post here, literally up on high at this moment. But there are things we know about how learning works, mm -hmm. and there are things that we're doing which are antithetical to what we know. Right? There's a gap between our knowledge and our behavior. And what are you seeing that like makes you feel good? about, OK, we are actually adapting to how learning works so that we can like, make better people, so that we can preserve something like a coherent society, which is ultimately, I think, the, the knowledge for knowledge's sake, valuable to some. But we have to live together, and that's part, we have to do things together. And I think that's my take on what learning is, can be about, is like, how do we do this stuff together? What are you seeing, it's a long question, that, that gives you hope about the new ways, the new knowledge we have? about how we acquire and apply knowledge. So um, I'm broadly negative, just to say. Uh, I think that we're deploying technology in a way that isn't uh, uh, sensitive to, so, so I see algorithms being deployed, reinforcing biases. Um, I see 
I, a fear that I have is that we're trying to come up with a, and, and, a lot, and a bunch of people in my lab are working on this, a definition of fairness that is uh, mathematical and uh, it's kind of like the insurance industry did this. There was a big, uh, there's a lot of activism in the early days of actuarial uh, insurance where people were saying fa fairness can be different. It, it, it does, should you be responsible just for the risk of your own category or should we spread <laughs> people's premiums so that you know, pre-existing pre -existing conditions should be allowed? Right. But it became a math formula mm. and it was ripped out of the hands of the activists and just turned into a thing that you could check. And that's gonna happen with algorithms if we're not careful. And fairness means at least seven different things. You know, it's, there's need, there's outcome, there's opportunity, and we should all be involved in what we think the fairness balance and trade-off should be for any particular thing. And so my concern is that it's still, even though you see a lot of conferences about fairness and accountability, mostly there are people who are like math explaining to each other that like having, it, it's difficult for, for a, a social scientist to be involved in a conversation about algorithmic fairness right now. So, so that I, I fear. So Skynet's that, gonna be racist. Yes. Okay, so, so I fear that. I, I think that we are starting to see some conversations to try to stop it, but I fear that that's rolling out. The, 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 if, just to jump to the hope, because I have a whole bunch of stuff I've, I I've, gather. I'm not happy about. Yes. Um, <laughs> I, I do think that some of the polls, and they're not all of them, and they're kind of random, so if you're selective in picking the ones that say the things that you want to hear, um, the millennials seem to be roughly saying that they don't want to join um, uh, companies that don't have social causes. Uh, roughly, millennials are starting to express that they're pissed off at us. And I think that the way that- I wonder why. I, I think that the only way you're going to change climate change, social inequity, and, um, and some of our health problems is you have to change people's values, right? And so, you know, I, I saw my, my sister was like, oh yeah, we don't want plastic bottles. I mean, you, you, you have to, but you, it has to feel disgusting to do something that's bad for the environment. And our age, we kind of, some of the, the edge people will do it, but I, I'm hoping that these kids, the, the new next generation, are gonna get really disgusted with us and they're gonna say, we can't, do this, and, and, and hopefully, and, and, and again, so, 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 so I feel, if I, in a hopeful moment, that there's a new kind of hippie movement-like thing that's emerging, that involves technology like the hippie movement did, that involves um, a, a, a mind expansion, whether it's whatever way it comes, and, <laughs> and um, <laughs> I'm an academic administrator. I can I, say the word. <laughs> um, but but, but, but I, I, I do think that we need a nonlinear, um, uh, value shift, mm -hmm. and that's going to come through culture, and that's why I've been poking at you about humor and things like yeah. that. I think it, it has to be, it's not going to be through carbon cap and trade, it's not going to be through new laws, it's not going to yeah. be through better algorithms, it's not going to be through better tech, it's going to be through a culture shift, and I think the culture shift does involve our educational system, our learning, and things like that, and I think also the shift in the educational system to be more focused on what we're going to be talking about here, I think is going to require a, a, a force of will that doesn't happen through incremental nudging. I think it has to be a whole bunch of kids saying, like the Parkland kids, I mean, 3,800 schools walked out yeah. because of them yeah. on an issue that we couldn't get anybody to do through the political system. So, so the, like the, the Parkland kids give me hope, yeah. you know, and it, and it gives me hope that they are, um, uh, are serious in some ways, and they're, um, I think they're in an incubator now that one of our new directors fellows, um, Amanda's running on um, the um, sort of theory of change, and, and how to do activism, and so, so it's, it's, it's that, that, that generation gives me hope, and it's not all of them, but the, enough of them that yeah. I think they will come and, and, and hopefully uh, keep some of us around after they burn the house down. <laughs> <laughs> we could do this for a long Can time, Joy. You wanna, there's a standing mic? Okay, so. Oh, we cool, have, I, we are, I was, I lied, please. If you have things to challenge Anyone? us on or ask, Questions. go to the mic in the middle. <laughs> or if you just want to stare awkwardly at us while we ask if you want to ask. Yeah. Hi. Short thing. Um, I just wanted to mention in the comment you said you didn't want to use the PET bottles for the conference. There's a company in Japan that's leveraging the limestone-based plastics and paper for the Olympics, so you should look into it. Limex. Okay. Awesome. Constructive. That's very good. I like it. Here we go. Oh, hey, Liz. Hi, I see you. And while she's asking, hey, it's actually low enough for me to talk into. It's awesome. Um, I don't know if you know, I'm a librarian, also. I did not uh, know that. Uh -huh. So, um, 
So I'm Liz Lawley. Uh, so I've got a question. You said if we try to break down humor, if we try to into its component parts and rules, we ruin it. Right? Um, and yeah, my son is getting a PhD right now in artificial intelligence, and he's interested uh -oh. in teaching computers how to have a sense of humor. Yeah. So oh, the question to take my job. is, do you? <laughs> Your son is a threat. So so. My question is to both of you, really, which is, do you think it's possible to teach computers to have a sense of humor? And if so, do you think it has to be done the way you talked about, which is they learn by doing, although we've seen some examples of how badly that can go wrong, right? Um, you know, what are your thoughts on this idea of teaching computers to have humor? Selfishly opposed. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But, so there are a couple of layers. Do I think it's possible? Yes. Um, and whether they actually have a sense of humor or just trigger the same responses in recipients <laughs> as one who does have a sense of humor would do is a meaningless distinction. Thus, yes. Um, why do we want to do that? For fun, for art, um, maybe. <laughs> I think, so we are, we are, it's weird, it's weird. Um, I think we will probably learn some things about who we are, how we create, what we define as funny when we have these other entities as a part of the creative process. So I don't simply see it as like, oh, your son's trying to take my job. That's the funny, like, stupid joke. But I think it does raise the stakes for like what is humor or what is a joke or what is a creative thing, who gets credit for that. It, it, you know, there is a volume issue. Machines are capable of such relentless output without labor laws or fuel in the traditional sense, the electricity. Um, so I hope his AI doesn't like drain all of the Earth's energy to crank out jokes, because that's what it's optimized to do. I hope there's like a limit that he places on it. Because <laughs> that would be a terrible way to go extinct. Oh, the joke AI <laughs> murdered all of us because <laughs> it needed our blood, you know, <laughs> uh, to try to compete with Chappelle. That's an absurd way to go out. Uh, those are some early thoughts. I'm, it's like, let's scramble the question, Joy. Yeah, so I think there's a couple of parallels. So, so I think it's interesting because Google Translate actually takes a corpus of translation to then create translations. And so there's a fear that people have that Google Translate could actually drive translators out of business and the corpus stops growing. So if you're just doing the kind of pattern matching type um, tr translation and that you're using, because I could imagine that jokes could be useful for increasing user engagement on Facebook and other social media. For Yay. example, but, um, but it also could be. That's what we need more time but, on but, but I think it could also be. <laughs> I think, though, if you, and again, this is kind of maybe a little bit too <coughs> technical, but I think if you actually understood humor better, you might understand learning better. And it gets back to this area that I don't know enough about, but I'm curious about, which is the role of surprise and laughter and, and play in learning, which is, I think, a lot of what you, you, you um, work on. And I think that having a computer trying to generate and understand what makes somebody laugh and then what do they learn from it, I think is an interesting <coughs> research exercise. And then more broadly, there's a lot of work in machine learning that we're doing in, for instance, in the future publishing, where we're trying to ingest all the life science papers, like a million a year, no human can read them, to try to look for the interesting questions that we might want to ask. And so if you think about humor as also, or just laughter as this thing when something unexpected happens, if you think of that, that's sort of similar to a novel idea. And so I think the algorithm that we're going to use to try to come up with novel places to look for interesting ideas. And so, for instance, one of our students is working on how can you create a, a system for peer review that helps surface novel ideas rather than suppress them, which is the, what um, Kareem Lakhani has shown, um, is, is what happens when you have um, traditional peer review. So, 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 so there's, I think there's some interesting stuff there to poke around, but I would look at it sort of in the context of learning, I think might be a, a, a useful uh, uh, place to look. There's a company that came out of the comedy hack day community called Botnik Studios. Your son should look at them. They are, they're sucking in a corpus of comedy. They're having bots write jokes and monologues. And some of it's great. Uh, and some of it's obviously horrible. <laughs> and that's art, <laughs> you know, human or machine made. 
best version, it inspires us, and we have new tools with which to create. Worst version, we become blood fuel for the joke AI. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm Sana Joffrey with the Chicago Learning Exchange. Uh, my question. Yes, yeah. <laughs> um, we talked a little about, about the assault on public goods like public libraries. I wanted to hear more of your thoughts on another public resource like public education as a selfishly a formal educator, kind of understanding what you think of the future of public education and um, technology, whether that's in the education space or in, um, as an educator or as a librarian and other resources. <coughs> I think it's good. <laughs> I, I think public edu education is something that should be preserved. And I say this as a product of public and private education myself. Um, I want to live in a world where we use our collective resources to create collective opportunity. I think education is an important piece of that. I think we're, what's, what's interesting to me is the new outlets people have to learn things that are totally outside of any system. Uh, YouTube lesson here, books there, project-based learning things, and how do you, when the standard is set somewhat from the top down by a board and a curriculum, there's a way to standardize and try to manage equal access to that. We also fail at that, but there's some measurability and accountability. With all these experiments that are going on, some of which are superior in certain applications to what is available through formal, how do you ensure universal access quality, uh, that you're not turning people into monsters, that there's some consistency to that product, if you will. And I'm, I don't know what's happening in that space, but that's a question that emerges for me. It's not simply to protect the old public tool system. That's probably not a long-term defensible approach. But how do you protect its goals of universal access, of shared values, of accountability, uh, measurability, things that we need to, to make sure we're not randomly cranking out opportunity because uh, that's bad for all of us. I, you know, I, I think about it in kind of internet terms. So when before the internet, we had these monoliths that were telephone companies, and there were these experiments like uh, Minitel or uh, uh, Captain in Japan, where the telephone company had the wires and the databases, and they decided what the content was going to be. And then the internet decided, or we decided, that we could layer it. So the telephone companies took care of the the physical layer, and then you had the ISPs took care of the next layer, and then you had the web companies took care of the next layer, and, and that allowed each layer to be unbundled from the other layers and to be innovative and diverse and competitive. And so I think that it's really important to have libraries, to have public schools as a physical thing, first of all, to have it as a supported thing. But like if I look at Japan, which is worse than the US in terms of top-downness, where you have the Ministry of Education actually tells what you can teach in each school and approves the, the, what, the textbooks and actually tells universities what they need to do and how many faculty they can have. I think that's way too top-down to be responsive to a changing environment that we, that, that we have and also to do the kind of experimentation we need. So I, I don't, I'm wondering whether there's a way to sort of unbundle it a little bit and decentralize it, at least experimentally, to show a different governance structure for what goes on inside of schools. And, and, and this is, I think, part of what the connected learning idea was. Is can we connect it out into other things? So I think the idea of having a public school where kids can come and, and participate and do things is a, is a wonderful base platform. But, but I, I'm, I'm concerned that that, that the, the design of a huge system uh, is, is really, really hard to change um, uh, with all of the incentive systems that we, we have. And, and I, you know, I, I feel sorry for people who, who um, have, have been struggling for so long without having the kind of change or the experimentation that they've been hoping to have. Because I do think that you have to change the public system. You can't just only do um, you know, like rich people experiments on the side. And so, so um, anyway, that's my, my point of view. So you may have sort of just answered my question slightly because I was already lined up. So I'm still going to kind of ask because I think that it could be elaborated on. She's um, not giving away her shot. <laughs> I will not throw away my shot. <laughs> I am Alexander Hamilton. I'm not. Um, anyway, um, so... This has a lot to do with um, the, the entrenched nature of um, the, the public education system. I'm a public educator. Um, and if I'm incoherent, I'm sorry, because I slept on planes. 
so I didn't get real sleep. Um, but you talked about the, the sort of ADD, OCD dichotomy, right? And um, a sort of shift or movement toward um, a more ADD kind of um, community or perception of learning and things like that. But then we look at the education system and it's so entrenched. And we look at reform movements that have been made to do things like connected learning, which, have, which started like in the 1920s, right? And so you talked a lot about concerns for the future, but also hopes for the future. And I was wondering if you guys could just elaborate on like, what are the concerns in terms of like shifting what we do in public education, but then what are the hopes? What, what possibilities do you see? Um, what, what openings do you see for us to kind of hack that system? So let me give an example that's only peripherally related, but I think it's a good example. So, um, so there was a, so I work closely with the ACLU and one of my best friends there, Kate Crockford, um, emailed me and said, we have to write an op-ed together because the bunch of MIT students got a bid to do an algorithm to redo the bus routing for the Boston schools and it's really unfair and we have to describe that it's not about the algorithm though, it's because the mayor and his uh, 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 school uh, board um, <coughs> inputted an optimization that really s screws families. And there were all these protests by mothers who were sh showing up saying, now I have to pick my kid, drop my kids off at seven, I've got to pick them up at one, this is horrible. And so we wrote an op-ed for the Boston Globe and then that day the mayor backed off and said, okay, we're not gonna do these new bus routes. But then the students from MIT came and said, you know, you got it all wrong. We spent years going around and talking to families, talking to disadvantaged mothers that had multiple jobs. And actually, by the way, if you look, um, the, all the mothers who are protesting are white. But over something like 80% of the families are black. <laughs> and they're not there protesting. Um, and so what, we, what ends up happening is when you try to help the disadvantaged families, somebody gets the end of the short, the short side, and it's some of these wealthier families, and they're the ones that had the wherewithal to go and march on, um, and, uh, on, on City Hall and get the press. And what was interesting about this whole thing, because the, the, the strategy with the researchers and the school board and, and the mayor was, the mayor would just hold the line and push it through and it would be good. And the, the poor families, I don't think, noticed that there was this whole thing going on, because they're so busy having all these multiple jobs. So there wasn't a single person in the system that had ill will, right? So the mayor was trying to do the right thing. If you're a mom and, you're, you know, and, and you're, you're, your schedule sucks, you're gonna go and protest, and you all show up, and you're, you're all, you all agree. And so it was a democratic system failure, but it was without any malice at least as, our, as far as I can see. And so there are two things I think we can do, and this is what we're trying to do with the criminal court system. I think we can do it with, with, with schools, which is um, we're trying to use technology in a way, gets back to my point about how we deploy, so that people can understand what the trade-offs are and are involved in the process. So, so one of the key words I think that recently is emerging in machine learning and, and from our lab is, is, is causality, causal inference, causal networks, is instead of using machines to try to predict things like recidivism rate or your likelihood of doing well, um, to use machines to try to understand the relationship between going to prison and poverty and education and, and, and then allow policymakers and families to be able to say, okay, if we do this, this policy change, here's probably what's gonna happen. Rather than, would you like predictive policing to be more accurate? Our recidivism rates are really accurate, so we're going to now um, put these people in jail longer because they're more likely to commit crimes. Well, prediction is really unfair. Prediction takes power from poor people and gives it to authorities. That's what prediction does um, when it's deployed in, in society. And so most of machine learning is really worshiping this idea of using machines to make our current system more efficient and more predictive rather than how do we understand the causal relationships between everything that's going on in society, which we should be able to do now with all this data, and how do we integrate that into a conversation with the community that's impacted, and then how do we t then turn that into a political process? And, and I think what's interesting, yeah, and I think, I think that the reason the political process doesn't work, why the poor families didn't show up, is because they're not being given any data that helps them make any decisions, so why should they even show up? And so I think it's a twofer thing. If you start to expose all the underlying relationships, does drug testing actually help 
um, the community, or does it just make the judge feel like they're doing something punishing when they're giving, you know? So, so that kind of causal system, I think that could actually re-engage um, communities in democracy, and I think that the school system's the same way. Does testing actually help? And these are all things that you guys are doing, but can we then surface it in a way so that we can have a coherent conversation as a society? Because I think that all these policies are just the products of politics by professionals and, and, and not, not by communities. So that's, sorry, it's a rant. No, it's a great rant, and yes. <laughs> Because what you would do, I love this. I love this a lot, and I think it's, it's an audit of bullshit, right? <laughs> You're calling for a bullshit audit. And so many of the systems that we've put in place, we've convinced ourselves work because it works for people in power. And there has no, been no real accountability for it. And they've been able to say, well, I just know. Prove it, show your work. Like, do what the teacher would have asked you to do in front of the class with the, the whiteboard or the chalkboard. And, and, and I will say, what's interesting that we're finding with judges, because we're doing this now in the criminal court system, they intuitively know that, like, the ankle bracelets with GPS and the curfews and the drug testing might not actually be helping lower crime. And they love when we go in and say we're going to do a study. And my guess is that teachers also kind of know that there's something wrong with the system and, but they're not given the opportunity to be part of this design process. And I think that, again, technology and, and now that I'm here in this august institution, scholarship uh, together uh, can actually uh, maybe surface enough material so that yeah. we can have a non-bullshit conversation rather than, you know, vendorware from conferences. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to... No, no, but it, 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 I'll, I, I, this, is, this is a point worth belaboring, and I apologize, I'll be so brief. That process, that data, that information must be paired with the cultural movement. Yep. I'm going to use your words again back because if there's no demand for that level of transparency and accountability and measuring, it won't happen. We have seen we don't need more data mm -hmm. on climate. Right? There is a break in our political process which is preventing a minority to hold the planet hostage. So data, yes, also be in the streets also leverage power and money and all, all expressions of power to force the conversation. Because it may not be malice, but goodwill, true goodwill is also hard to come well, by. Well, I, I gave that example as the only example that I can think of that doesn't have malice. <laughs> I, I, think, I think most systems have some. Have some malicious that, yeah, yeah. Okay. It looks like we have two more. Yeah. Maybe we can, okay. okay. One more. Oh, you're the last, yeah. It's gonna be so good. Uh, I like your shoes. <laughs> Um, so Wait, I my shoes? Or? How do you coordinate it? More, oh. more his shoes. Oh, no, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. It's got great but shoes. But this question is directed towards you. I want to come back to talking about using comedy as a platform for an activist message. You spoke a bit about using comedy as a way to really hit the people in your audience with the message you want to deliver. I imagine there's a part of it that is also about broadening your potential audience so that then you can communicate your activist message to a larger audience that you brought in through comedy. Yeah. Um, how do you balance broadening your audience without um, making your activist message too potent to scare them away? Yeah. <sighs> Informally, sometimes poorly, not always consciously. And whenever, I remember that it's not my job alone. And I think there's hundreds of people here at this conference, maybe thousands, millions, millions of you in this conference. Um, it is not any of our jobs alone to like resolve the whole thing. So I, if I am able to expand a little bit, that's cool. It's not, I don't need to reach everyone. And so I also think about what how do I go deeper with who's already there? How do I keep an open door to those who aren't yet there? And how do I not compromise myself to reach those so far away? And like, I don't have an interest. You know, there are folks who will go and like sit down with the Klan, right, and try to have like a heart to heart. That's not me. And I have gained respect for people who do that, I think it's soul crushing work. I think it takes a willpower and a self control and an expansive heart 
I don't think that's why I'm here. And so partly it's understanding that this is a network and I am a node in that network. I'm not responsible for the whole functioning of the system. And if I can make sure that I'm trying to be a contributor to the overall goal with what I already know how to do and who I can reach and maybe a group adjacent on either side, cool. But I don't want to contort myself out of shape and out of values and out of principle for some vague higher notion of like, well, you got to reach this extremist over here. I don't. And I also think that the perception that we have been offered through our media right now is that there's a bunch of extremists. And we got to bend over backwards and do like another heartfelt profile of a Nazi to understand deeply how they like the barbecue. It's, no, I don't, I don't care. What is much more at play are the folks who aren't showing up in the political process, are those who have an emotional attachment to a story that feels more compelling and more resonant. So where I get excited and where I do think I have a responsibility is to try to tell a more attractive story that could lure in someone who's on the fence, who can go either way. People voted twice for Obama and once for Trump. OK, so maybe they weren't ever really with Obama, <laughs> right? if you're down with child kidnapping. Like maybe that's not, maybe you were always fungible. And so there's a little competition around that. So those are some of the thoughts. That was a great question. I will honestly keep thinking about that. Yeah. So please join me in thanking Joey and Bartender. Thank you, man. My shoes are better, also. My shoes are better.